He wanted to give her what she wanted for the story, but he also didn't want to appear weak to her. He wanted to like, you know, seem like he knew what he was talking about and appear confident. Um, so yeah, that dynamic was really interesting and I didn't want to talk to him about stuff that he was thinking about. Like, it was really frustrating because like he was such an interesting guy and like, you know, he was seeing all this stuff and he did want to talk about it. Bring up your host for the evening. Um, we're super lucky to have her here. Her name is Asma Malik. She's a journalist and a creative digital strategist. She is currently a teacher at Ryerson, but she has been an editor and a columnist at Toronto Star and the Montreal Gazette and a number of other publications. Please welcome her to the stage with me. Thanks so much, Natalie. Uh, good evening. Um, as Natalie said, my name is Asma Malik. I'm a journalism professor at Ryerson University. And tonight, it's my pleasure to be introducing Sarah Glidden. Uh, Sarah studied painting at Boston University and started making comics in 2006 when she was living at the Flux Factory Artist Collective in Queens. Her first book, How to Understand Israel in 60 Days or Less, was initially published as a series of mini comics, earning her the prestigious Ignatz Award for Promising New Talent in 2008. Um, the complete book was published in 2010 and translated into five languages. Her work has appeared in various newspapers and magazines, as well as in the Best American Comics Anthology. And recently, she hit the campaign trail with U.S. Green Party presidential candidate Jill Stein for the NIB, and uh, she, wrote, she created a very compelling piece of comics journalism about the spoiler effect in American politics. We'll see how that plays out. Um, she began work on her latest book, Rolling Blackouts, in 2010, uh, after a successful Kickstarter campaign took her and her journalist friends on a two-month trip to Turkey, Iraq, and Syria. Um, the book, which centers on the plight of refugees, raises fundamental questions about the nature of journalism. So I'm excited to be here tonight to talk to her. Um, we're going to start off tonight uh, with Sarah talking, walking us through her work, and then we'll sit down for a chat. And after that, uh, we'll open it up to questions. So ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Glidden. Thank you, Asma. And thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, thanks to the Toronto Reference Library. This is one of my favorite places um, because I've come here for TCAF um, quite a few times. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, as Asma said, Rolling Blackouts is a work of comics journalism about journalism. So it's kind of a meta journalism book. Um, but I didn't always do comics journalism. I came into journalism a little bit sideways through another kind of nonfiction, um, which is autobio and memoir. Um, when I first started reading comics, I was of course reading kind of like the basic graphic novels or nonfiction graphic novels that a lot of people would read, like Persepolis, Maus, and Joe Sacco's Palestine. And while I really loved those works, they weren't exactly something that I looked at and said, I can do this. Um, I needed to find my way into comics in a way that seemed accessible. Um, so what I found was that there were a lot of people at the time, this was 10 years ago, who were doing autobio comics, kind of journal comics, comics about daily life. And I thought that that would be a great way to try, and, try to like get my feet wet in the medium. So every day for several months, I did a four panel or six panel comic about something that happened to me, like making pasta, for example, and getting my eyeglasses fogged up. And what I liked about doing this was that it gave me an opportunity to experiment with comics as a language, to experiment with different kinds of drawing styles, and to not be precious about how things turned out. Because if you do a comic and it turns out kind of crappy, Another thing is going to happen to you tomorrow, and you can do it again then. Um, and after a while doing these, I had kind of really decided that comics was something that I wanted to pursue, but I wanted to do something longer. Um, and so in a conversation with my mother, she brought up um, these things called birthright Israel trips, which I'm sure some of you know about. Um, they're all expenses paid, 10-day trips um, funded in part by the State of Israel for young Jewish people. And you go all over the country and you hear about um, how great Israel is and it makes, they hope that you form a connection with the country and um, want to either move there or just like re maintain a relationship. 
I had at the time, you know, very strong feelings about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I still do. And so I was really interested to go on this trip and see how a guided tour funded by that country was going to talk about such a complex issue. And I thought that I would just go, I would document my trip, and it would just do kind of a long version of my daily journal comics. It would be about me and my experiences and kind of the thoughts and feelings that I had about it. So I wasn't really going into this thinking that I was doing journalism, but it did involve a lot of you know talking to people, doing a lot of research about the conflict and about the history of the country. And the book does talk about those things, but it really isn't a book that is supposed to explain the conflict. Um, it's really about one person's kind of, I've heard the phrase used, emotional journey. And as much as that makes me cringe, it's true. Um, there's a lot of crying in it on my part. Um, and so it's really just like all internal. But what was great about using comics to show an internal journey like that was that I could really use the language of comics to show how imagination works and how thoughts work. The way I saw it, comics kind of depict our inner thoughts because we think not in words and not in just pictures, but in a combination of them. We imagine things. So for example, in this page, our guide was talking about the Golan Heights and the battle over the Golan Heights, and we were all looking at this kind of big room size model. And so I kind of show myself imagining the Syrian villagers coming to life and, and escaping over the border. Or on this page, I was thinking we were daydreaming on the bus and thinking about how I really don't even understand the logistics of a war or a battle. You know, is it hand-to-hand -hand combat? Is there helicopters, dinosaurs? I don't know. Um, so I was able to use comics to kind of like go all over the place with that and explore this issue um, in a very personal way. Now. As I was working on this book, some friends of mine who I had lived with when I lived in New York um, were starting a nonprofit journalism collective that was first called the Common Language Project and then renamed the Seattle Globalist. They moved back to their hometown of Seattle from New York so that they could kind of get this um, journalism collective going. And so there's two of them there on the cover of the book. That's Alex Stonehill. He's the videographer and photojournalist and Sarah Studeville. Um, who's kind of, uh, she's a writer and was kind of like the head journalist on this project. And I know it's kind of confusing that there's two Sarahs in this book, but that is her name. And because this is a work of nonfiction, I wanted to stay true to that. Um, so in Seattle, the globalist reporters really focused a lot on local issues related to social justice, immigration, deportation, um, and um, First Nations rights. But about once a year, they were able to get grant funding to do a kind of larger international reporting project. So one year, they went to East Africa to report on water scarcity and how that contributes to conflict in the region. The year after that, they went to Pakistan to report on madrasas and education. And I would visit them every summer, always in the summer, because Seattle is much nicer in the summer. Um, and they would like regale me with stories of their reporting trips and I was just like fascinated. You know, it just sounded like this really glamorous, interesting job and I had so many questions. You know, how do you find your stories? How do you find your sources? What is a fixer? How do you find an interpreter? You know, I just really wanted to find out more and in talking to them, I realized that I had always taken a part of journalism for granted, the where it comes from part. Um, I make the metaphor a lot, it was kind of like the way I think about water. Like I turn on my sink and the water comes out and I you know, take a glass of water and I don't really think about where the pipes are going, whether it's from the reservoir or from some other kind of aquifer. Um, but it is kind of important to know where your water comes from, right? Because once it's gone, you wish that you had um, looked a little bit more into that. And I thought that journalism was the same way. You know, I'm a good, progressive, like college educated white girl. I, you know, listen to NPR, I read the New York Times, and I always took for granted that the news that I was consuming was, you know, unbiased and fair, and that I knew where it came from. It came from journalists. But in talking to my friends, I realized that there's a lot more that goes into this that I don't understand, and that maybe 
it would be better for me to kind of look into what is behind the curtain of journalism and make a book about it so that I could show other people um, how this works. So I propose to the globalist journalists that on their next international reporting trip, I go with them and shadow them and make a book about how they do their jobs. And they said yes. Um, I know for Sarah that her impulse was to kind of see what it felt like to be on the other side of things. She had been a reporter for six or seven years at that point. You know, she had made a career out of talking to people and then portraying them um, in her stories. And they didn't always like how they were portrayed because that's kind of part of journalism. And so she wanted to have the mirror turned back on herself, as she put it. So she, you know, and all of them gave me this incredible access to go with them um, on their next reporting trip, which was um, in late 2010. They wanted to go to northern Iraq and Syria to report on Iraqi refugees and kind of displacement in general in that region and the fallout from the war in Iraq and the war on terror. So we left in November 2010. Um, we started in Turkey, where we did a lot of um, interviewing with refugees and refugee agencies. Um, kind of our first interview that I sat in on was with a young Iranian refugee couple who are living in southeastern Turkey, that's like the Kurdish region. Um, and that was my first experience with finding a translator when, you know, you're on the road. We couldn't find uh, anyone who spoke Farsi and English in that town because it was, you know, a Turkish and Kurdish speaking place. So we ended up um, Skyping in a translator, a friend of theirs from Germany. And so right away I could see like, okay, this is gonna be interesting. Um, and then after that we took um, a bus over the border into northern Iraq. Now, northern Iraq at that time and still now was a fairly um, safe place. Um, it's kind of like away from all of the violence in southern Iraq, although these days um, ISIS is kind of encroaching on all sides. Um, but it was this very interesting city called Sulaymaniyah, and we were there to interview this guy. Um, his name is Sam Malkandi. He was um, an Iraqi Kurdish man who, during the Iraq-Iran war, he was called up for military service, and he deserted with his pregnant wife um, over the mountains into Iran. And really, his life was like a series of very tragic circumstances. His wife became depressed and committed suicide. He was left with his baby daughter, and then they eventually went to Pakistan and lived in a refugee camp there for about eight years. He remarried, um, they had another child, him and his new wife, and finally, finally, their application for refugee status in the US was accepted, and they were able to make it over to Seattle and start a new life, and everything was looking great until 9-11 happened, and after the 9-11 commission report came out, it turned out that his name was in one of the footnotes that he was accused of aiding one of the um, Al-Qaeda terrorists in trying to get a visa to come to the US. Now, no proof was ever found to link him to this, but nonetheless, he was deported on a technicality, um, just as a way, we think, for the government to get rid of him. So he was, once again, separated from his family and living back in Iraq with with his aging father um, and away from his wife and kids. So he agreed to let the globalist reporters um, do a documentary on him. And so we spent a lot of time interviewing him um, and that full length documentary is out now, it came out a couple of years ago, it's called Barzan. Um, and so that's what we were doing there. But the kind of, the initial idea for them doing reporting in the Middle East was to go to Syria and to look into Iraqi refugees. Now, Syria was very different in late 2010. You know, this is, you know, we were there about three months before things started happening um, in Syria. Actually, the Arab Spring kind of started while we were in Syria, but it's, you know, it started in uh, North Africa. So we were in Damascus because Damascus is one of the, was one of the centers for Iraqi refugees. There's Iraqi refugees would go to Syria or Jordan if they could afford to leave the country at all. And most of those who went to Syria were in Damascus. Um, now, reporting is very difficult um, in Syria. Well, now it's impossible. But at the time, very difficult for um, Syrian journalists and very difficult for foreign reporters because they really don't want you looking into things that are um, 
let's say, like the, not flattering to the government, but the government was very proud of how they treated Iraqi refugees. They opened their borders, they let them live there, um, they let their children go to school and have free health care. They did not let um, the kids have higher education, though, and, par and adults can't work. So it was a tricky situation, and that was something that we wanted to look into. Um, for the reporters and for myself, we thought that the Iraq War and what had happened to people affected by the Iraq War was kind of a story that was underreported these days in the U.S. You know, here was a war that we started, and once Barack Obama was elected, I think people were really eager to kind of turn the page and move on and say, oh, that was a terrible thing. What a big mistake that we made. Um, but, you know, look at all our domestic problems. We have to, like, we have to just move on. Um, and we thought, no, we really need to look at this, what's going on. And our generation, especially, who were young and in our early 20s when the war started, now we're adults and we're taking the reins. And so it's a good time to kind of understand what has happened to people there. Um, the other wrinkle, so right now, for now, my like assignment was very simple. I was gonna go with these reporters, look at what they do, make a book about it. Um, but the wrinkle that was introduced into this whole project um, happened when Sarah decided to invite a childhood friend of hers, Dan, to come with us on this trip. Now, Dan, like Sarah, grew up in, you know, Seattle's a very progressive city in the US. Um, Dan had hippie parents just like Sarah did. Um, but unlike Sarah, Dan joined the military when he was 25. That was his answer to the war in Iraq, was that he wanted to go there and fight in it himself. Um, and this was something that you know, Dan's family and Dan's friends never really understood. So I think Sarah wanted to bring him along to kind of show, let him meet the people who had been affected by the war, sit in on some interviews, and kind of see the country again as a civilian instead of behind uh, the glass of a truck, which he had been a driver of armored vehicles. And her idea was that he would come on this trip, he would certainly change the way he felt about the war, and she was going to interview him throughout the process and make an article or maybe a radio documentary about the Marines' return to Iraq and how it changed him. Um, to me, it was kind of, I think that she was kind of showing him journalism. You know, this is like live action journalism. Instead of having someone read an article, you're just showing them everything. And the whole idea with journalism is that people come into an issue with, you know, their preconceived notions, they read what you've written, they get new information, and those ideas change a little bit. Um, unfortunately, you don't really have control over the timeline that that happens for people. So there ended up being a lot of disagreements between them, you know, interviews turned into fights, and, you know, like, she ended up storming out of the room at one point. It was a whole big mess. Um, but it was interesting um, to watch. So we were there for two months. The book took five and a half years to make. Um, part of the reason that it took so long was because all of the dialogue in the book is real dialogue. So that's me with my recorder there. I had short hair at the time. I paint my hair lighter than it actually is. There's no reason for that, uh, in case you're wondering. Um, but so I always had my recorder out. Um, I had my recorder out when we were in interviews. I had my recorder out when we were at breakfast talking about what our day's plans were. I had my recorder out when we were walking around new cities and kind of commenting on what we were seeing. And I definitely had my recorder out at the end of the day when we were drinking three or four or five beers and talking very earnestly about journalism in America and you know what its place is. So when I came back, I had, you know, a couple hundred hours of all of these conversations, and I wanted to transcribe all of it. Um, most seasoned journalists would not do this. I was not a seasoned journalist, and I'm kind of a pack rat. Um, so this is, you can see kind of, this is just like a fraction of the audio files I had there, and then I transcribed them on the right. Um, I really, I wanted to transcribe them all because I wasn't sure how the book was going to fit together yet. But also, I really wanted to be able to see all of the dialogue we had. And there was, and some people asked, like, well, why didn't you get, you know, hire somebody to transcribe it for you or use one of those programs that, like, takes your speech and makes it into text? And the reason for that is because this was going to be a visual book. I needed to remember 
how people were saying things, not just what they were saying. So when you listen to an audio recording of something, you can hear the pauses in their speech. You can like kind of almost see their body language. If you spent a lot of time observing them, you kind of know how they move and you know when they're kind of going to make a sarcastic look, if they're saying something kind of sarcastic. So for me, listening to these files was a kind of way of reliving the whole trip and really kind of remembering um, everything that happened there. The other reason why it took five and a half years is because it was just a much more complicated story for me to write than the first book. Um, and in the first book, because it was, like I said, about my imagination and what I was thinking about things, you know, I had a lot of visual tricks that I could use, like those people coming to life and dinosaurs to kind of like liven things up. But this book was not about my inner thoughts, and I couldn't very well make a book about someone else's inner thoughts because I didn't know what they were. So I really had to keep this book grounded in reality. Um, and so for me, the focus was what is the relationship between journalists and the people they're talking to, and like how can I show who these people are um, and using comics? So some like the relationships really range. Here we have, this is um, Thomas. He's a representative of the UNHCR, which is the United Nations High Commission for Refugees. They're the agency that really deal with all um, kind of um, registering refugees officially, helping them get resettled um, and stuff like that. And this is an expert interview. So we're just going in to talk to him about um, what he does, get some basic facts on refugees. And experts are used to having journalists talk to them. This is kind of their job. And so for him, it was easy. And that was one of our first interviews is talking to him. But you need to have a much different relationship when you're talking to someone who you're actually making work about, who you're making a documentary about. Um, and so I wanted to show the relationship between the journalist and Sam. And I also wanted to show who Sam is. Um, you know, we interviewed him in this room which here's a photo of that same room. Um, this room is a very particular place because this is where he used to live with his first wife who died. Um, so it's an apartment above his father's house, um, which you know used to be this place full of love and now it's this like empty rooms that nobody uses. So I wanted to really show that room and show like what it means to Sam um, to be interviewed in that place. And when I'm thinking about place in comics, I want to show, like I'm going to places that you know a lot of you have probably never been before. Um, so I want to show how different a place is, but I also want to show how the same you know, places in the world are, especially now that we're so globalized and everything. Um, you know, for example, that blue chair. I drew that kind of plastic lawn chair a lot in this book. And I really kind of tried to make a point of putting it in there because that's a chair that I think all of us know. And so, like putting these things in the comic, I want you to read it and kind of be reminded that if maybe if you were born in a different place or if your life was a little bit different, you could have Sam's story too, that you know he's not all that different from any of us. Um, I do use some flashbacks in the book. Um, you know, someone like Joe Sacco will use flashbacks a lot because he's really focusing on like the story that the person is telling. Um, so, for example, here Sam is talking about his uh, student days in Baghdad. He studied drama. Um, and when he was drafted into the army, initially he was in kind of like the, like the entertaining the troops, USO type thing. But mostly I wanted to keep the story grounded um, in the here and now. Like, who is Sam now? Um, who is the Sam that is talking to these journalists? So, for example, this is a scene where we went to his house at like five in the morning to watch him do his kind of getting ready for work routine. Um, and, you know, they were filming him make tea, so I did these like kind of silent panels to show kind of what his life is like. Um, as we got to know him better, you know, he gave us access to family photos. Um, I tried to kind of paint these family photos in a way that will let you know that they're photographs um, and not cartoons. You know, these are people who are very important to him, so you want to take care when you're painting those. Um, and we met his family as well. So yeah, with Sam, we had the luxury of like our long, sustained relationship, many interviews over um, a week and a half of time. Um, with the Iraqi refugees in Syria, the reporter's mission was a little bit different. We weren't there to do a profile on just one of them. We wanted to really show the scope of what had happened to this country and what people were dealing with now. 
Um, so I have a lot of crowded panels in, this, in the Syria chapter. You know, these are people who are really a lot like my parents. You know, they're doctors, they're lawyers. Um, Iraq was a very um, professional country. These people had free access to education, um, so it's very educated, um, largely middle class. And so the reporters that I was with really wanted to show that to get people at home to identify with them. So we were in like these very crowded rooms all the time. And towards the end of the book, um, we went to the Duma Processing Center, um, which is like kind of a refugee center where you can both register but also um, pick up your rations. And so, you know, imagine like, I'm trying to imagine my mother, a doctor, like, living off of her savings in a new city and like, you know, going from having a job as a professor and a doctor to having to wait in line for four hours every two weeks just to get some rice and some oil. Um, and like kind of the indignity of that and like the crowdedness and the frustration of that was, this is kind of like the climax of the book. Um, when I deal with language in this book, I really, it was kind of something that I had to think about a lot. How do I show someone speaking a foreign language and someone else interpreting for them. So I went through a couple different ideas. I didn't want to put both balloons because it would have made for a very crowded panel. Um, and my panels are already pretty text heavy. Um, so I was inspired by documentary film and kind of radio documentary where you have someone begin to speak and then the interpreter kind of comes in on top of them and is overdubbed. So you can't really see it on this page, but usually I'll have the person begin speaking in their language, whether it's Arabic or Kurdish, and then I'll have the interpreter come in over there. In this particular scene, um, we were with this young lady, uh, Sarab, who was picking up her family's rations for that month, and other people started coming up and talking to the reporters. They saw that there were Western reporters and they wanted to speak to them. Um, and so she volunteered to interpret something that, you know, that's someone's job. And so she didn't really know what she was getting into. So at a certain point, when this Iraqi woman found out that we were from the United States, she had a lot of words, um, not so nice words, to say to us. And um, our, the young lady there didn't want to translate them. And so I decided to leave that untranslated. You know, she, she gets to interpreting on the next page or so. Um, but I thought about, should I subtitle it so that people can see what she's saying because it's kind of intense? Um, and I decided to leave it untranslated because with this book, I really kind of wanted you to be in the shoes of the journalist. And when you're a journalist, you're a representative of the country that you're from. So if you're an American journalist in Iraq and you're talking to refugees who have been made refugees by your country, you know, you're going to have to answer as many questions as you're asking. So I really wanted to put the reader in those shoes. And like this is, you know, a lot of this book is for an American audience. And, you know, my kind of idea making it was to kind of make Americans confront those questions too. And that includes the confusion of having somebody saying angry words to you and not knowing what they mean. Um, so I'm just going to talk very briefly about process before we go to our Q&A part. Um, so while I'm in these places, it would be ideal to have my sketchbook out and just like sketching all the time. Like it's very romantic, right? Like you're an artist and you're like just drawing in Syria. Um, but that doesn't really happen because, you know, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of people talking and I really needed to pay attention. And um, when you're drawing, you can't really like pay attention to what people are saying. When I'm drawing my comics, I can't even listen to like radio or podcasts until I'm at like the inking and painting part because the drawing part kind of just takes up too much of your brain. But it is really important, as I said before, that place and specificity um, plays a role in, in these books. So I did take a lot of pictures, kind of had like my recorder, my camera, and my notebook like in three hands. Um, so, for example, this is a street corner in Damascus, and this is the panel that I used that street corner for. And I know that my art looks very simple, and it is, um, but it is specific. And, you know, I do want that someone who's from that place or spent time there to maybe recognize that street corner if they look really closely. And I want the you know, the minivans in the background to be the kind of minivans that you find in Syria and not the kind that you find on the street here. Um, you know, here's a guy making tea and then, so there's that. Um, and, you know, in Syria, like, 
So a lot of comics is just showing things in the background without drawing attention to them. Um, in Syria, the first thing that you notice when you drive in from Lebanon, if you were to go there, um, is that there are just like tons and tons of pictures of Assad. There's Assad, Bashar al-Assad, and his father, Hafez al-Assad, and even um, his brother, Basil. Um, they're all over the place. And at first, it's just like you can't help but just notice every single one of them. But the more time you spend there, the more you just kind of get used to it. It becomes part of the background, and it becomes something that's just like, oh, yeah, that's the scenery just like anything else. Um, so I wanted to kind of include those pictures in the book and kind of like in the first page of the Siri chapter, they're actually counting these portraits of Assad, but, you know, as the chapter goes on, they're just kind of there um, and nobody's really addressing them anymore. Um, so I also like anatomy is difficult for me. Um, so a lot of scenes like this, which look like really easy to do, I actually take reference photos for those as well. So here's me in my pajamas. Um, cartoonists often work in their pajamas because they don't have to leave the house. Um, and I'll have my husband take pictures of me like making these poses and then those end up, you know, being the comic there. So I have like a whole file of pictures of me making like weird faces or like stuff like that. Um, I do use the sketchbook sometimes um, when, for example, you're in an interview where it's maybe like more intimate and it would be inappropriate to take pictures then I'll get the sketchbook out and kind of draw the scene and kind of get the feel for it. I also take a lot of notes. Um, and then, of course, border crossings are a great place for a sketchbook. You do not want to have a camera out at a border crossing, especially when you're going into Iraq or Syria. Um, so as soon as we would get close to those places, I would put the cameras away and start drawing furiously. Um, and it's hard because, like, you don't know what you're going to use later. So this is, like, the checkpoint between Turkey and Iraq. I did a couple different parts, and I ended up using that building um, there on the bottom. Oops. Um, and that becomes that. So you kind of like write little notes like orange sandy color so that you know how to paint it later. Um, this is the interior of that same checkpoint building. Um, on the right, there is a floor plan. So floor plans are like a really easy way to get a lot of information um, that you can use later. This building would be a nightmare for a floor plan, but that room was luckily a lot easier, and that's kind of a sketch on the, on the left of the same place, and then that becomes this panel here. Um, there were some situations where you could do a combo of sketching and pictures, so we went to a cockfight in Suleimania with one of the people we were interviewing, and you know, they told us, like, it's not really illegal because the birds don't they don't kill the birds. It's like more humane cockfight. I know that sounds bad. Um, but they said the men don't want to be photographed here. Like they don't want anyone to know that they were here, even though it's not technically illegal. So while the event was going on, I did a lot of drawings to kind of capture the mood and how crowded it was. Um, and then after everyone was gone, I could take pictures of the setting and the scenery and like the stuff on the walls. Um, and then I can combine those to make the page later. So here's these, I loved these portraits of the chickens. I think they look so regal. Um, and so I put those in the background and you know, maybe someone can't even notice what they are. It's just a small panel, but like I really just wanted to include them um, and put them there. Um, when I'm drawing these comics, I'm trying to like make characters out of everyone. Everyone who's like plays a significant role. And sometimes you only have like one picture of a guy so this guy was our fixer um, when we were in Syria. He was this, he used to be part of Saddam's army. He was a colonel. He has kind of shady connections to things. He was a weird guy, um, but he was a great character to draw. So I usually do a lot of sketching in my sketchbook before I start a new scene with a new character. Um, my husband's from Argentina. That's why that, that's what that weird stuff is. And I was drinking yerba mate. Um, and so that's, you can see kind of the page um, that I'm penciling on the side. And then this is the page in progress. Um, all of my work is watercolored. I usually pencil first, then ink over the pencils, and then erase all of the pencil, and then watercolor, and it kind of, um, that's the fun part. I love the painting part. So here's this guy, Harb. Um, he was pretty angry, and there's the finished Harb. And so, yeah, that's, that's it. And now, Asma and I can talk. Thank you. Thanks so much, Sarah. That was really 
Insightful, especially I, I like hearing you talk about watercoloring and actually doing something physical in a time where everything is so digital. <laughs> yeah, although I tried digital coloring when I was doing my first book. Um, I had never done a colored comic before, and when Vertigo signed um, the Israel book, they asked, like, okay, we have two requirements that you, you don't letter it because your lettering is atrocious and that you do it in color. <laughs> um, and I didn't know what I was going to do for the coloring, um, and I tried using Photoshop, um, but I had gone to school to study painting, so it just wasn't part of my brain. Um, and so that's why I picked up watercoloring. That's great. Um, so I wanted to start with just asking you a question about this kind of journalism. Um, Joe Sacco, who you mentioned, um, calls uh, what you and him both do um, low impact journalism as opposed to the journalism that we're bombarded with, you know, 24 hours a day, 140 characters, that we need to react to quite quickly. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about the process of spending you know, five and a half years on these two months of your life and what you think, uh, what you hope really the, um, the low impact would be of this kind of journalism. Yeah, well, it, it is really strange spending so long on such a short period of time. Like, you feel just like you're there for five years. And like, you know, in talking to, you know, the friends who were with me on that trip, I'd say things like, oh, you remember like the time when this happened and then you said that? And they're like, we don't remember that at all because like <laughs> I've been the one listening to our conversations and like sitting in this time. Um, but yeah, with this work, you know, it was important to me to find a subject that would still um, stand up years later. And I think that both, you know, looking at journalism and how it works, like journalism isn't really, you know, for better or for worse, journalism is not changing anytime soon. And, you know, I think this kind of reporting that they do, um, that is just like the way that journalism is done. And so I think that, you know, that could stand on the shelf for a while and be the same. But also when it comes to Iraq, like, you know, a lot of people ask me, like, well, Syria has changed so much since you were there. Um, you know, even Iraq has changed too, and so what do you think about that? And I think that it still matters that, you know, these things happened. And especially, like I said, for Americans, like, it's important to have, like, like a deeper look into kind of the effects of things that our foreign policy has done. So I, I think that, you know, there's other kinds of journalism to keep you up to date on the daily comings and goings and, like, the daily, like, political... Um, struggles over there. This to me is more like let's look deeper and like let's kind of really get to know um, the people who are there. Um, I think a lot about you know one of the first comics that I read like I said before was Persepolis and I was fairly young when I read that and I didn't know much about Iran um, and so after reading that book I really like I felt a deep connection to Marjan Satrapi like as a person. And so after that, whenever I would read something about Iran, I would always think like, oh, you know, I have a friend from there. Right. And that's the way I think about the kind of things that I do. Like, I hope that someone will read this kind of slower journalism and really like get to know Sam or get to know Syria or get to know an Iraqi refugee. Um, and then later when they see other articles or other books or documentaries, they'll kind of feel like, oh, wait, I kind of know something about that. Like I, I felt some feelings for that person and, and want to find out more. They feel like they've had that connection. Yeah, yeah that's great. Um, so one of the things uh, that comes up and part of the reason, uh, and uh, when you're talking about the process of journalism, following um, your friends Sarah and Alex, um, they're constantly pitching stories along the way. Mm -hmm. So it's really, um, you know, they're finding stories as, as they're traveling and, um, and, you know, it's important for them to actually sell the stories and have uh, someone, you know, that wants to publish their work. Um, and your friend Sarah mentions, like, you know, she's got what she calls the friend test, in which, like, you know, her friends are very busy, they don't have that much time, but, you know, if they have 15 minutes a day to do something, how can she tell a story that will be part of those 15 minutes? And um, I think sometimes we forget the connection between journalism and the audience. And I was wondering, in terms of your story, how, how important is it to you um, that, your, that your work reaches a wide audience? Uh, pretty important. <laughs> I want people to read it. You know, journalism means nothing if there's not someone there to look at it and to kind of think about the things that you're saying. And you really hope that that your piece, you know, isn't taken in isolation, that it becomes part of, you know, a, like a healthy, varied diet of journalism that somebody reads. Um, so it's very important, but it is very hard. Like, you know, I see 
I've been like really interested in watching how different like online news organizations try to attract people to different pieces. Like there was that whole trend of like, watch what you won't believe what happens next. <laughs> Clickbait, yeah. Or then there were like listicles, like people doing like, you know, ten things you didn't know about Syria. Um, and I don't really know what the trend is right now, but like you see these organizations always trying to find a new way to to get people to pay attention and. You know, a lot of it might sound cheesy, like like BuzzFeed and all that, but like you know, I think at the heart, these are organizations that do want people to to know about um, the things that their reporters are producing. Um, but it is very difficult. Um, you know, there used to be just like one newspaper in your town to read, and there just used to be like two TV channels that had news, and so like that's what you would read or watch. And it's great that now we have like a huge variety of of news and we have lots of different kinds of voices giving you those news but then you know there's a lot of competition and you yeah, know. filtering is the challenge right yeah. how do you have a focus on so many different things yeah. at the same time um, it's our question there Well, that's a good point. Um, the question was about um, news organizations um, having had before kind of pub like government support. Sure. Well, I don't know about in Canada, but in the U.S., I don't think we ever had um, government support for for news. Sure. Yeah. Well, news it does exist in a capitalist system, so then, yeah. it is. That yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Yes. Um, okay. We're just gonna we're gonna we're gonna come back to the audience um, in a few questions. Don't worry. Um, so yeah, just to sort of uh, launch off of that, this sort of process of journalism and this transparency that your coming on the trip was was supposed to bring, um, uh, and did bring. Um, you talk about uh, Dan, the ex-Marine, um, who, who was a childhood friend of uh, Sarah, uh, who was along for the trip. And throughout the book, there's this tension between uh, Sarah and Dan. Um, she really wants him to, you know, uh, she really wants him to open up about what it's like to be back in Iraq after having been there, um, uh, after having served there. And he seems reluctant and reticent. And um, I was, and, and I know, and you, and, you know, when you're talking about your own experience, you talk about how, like, in more, um, in your private moments with Dan, when it's just the two of you, you're worried that you're going to scoop Sarah, or he's going to say something that's going to make you, you know, that he should save for her. Um, how did you feel about that dynamic between Sarah and Dan? And I was also wondering if she's read the book and what her thoughts are on that, looking back. She has read the book, and I think that, you know, even just like after the trip was over, she realized that she had been maybe pushing him a little bit too much. Um, I think Dan was really reluctant to give her like his own doubts um, about himself and his service, um, partly because he knew he was being interviewed, but also when he was talking to me, he knew the recorder was on. He would tell me, don't put this in your book, like whenever he like would said something that he, yeah. Um, so he knew that I was recording too, but I think also there was a, the, there's a reason why journalists don't usually report on their friends, um, because there's just an extra dynamic there. Um, and with Dan, you know, they talk about this in the book, but when they were kids, they were like friends when they were tweens, right? And Sarah was a year older. And when you're a teenager, like when you're 12 years old, some, a friend being a year older is a big deal. Like you want to impress them. And I think that he still had that feeling. Like he, he wanted to give her what she wanted for the story, but he also didn't want to appear weak to her. He wanted to like, you know, seem like he knew what he was talking about and appear confident. Um, so yeah, that dynamic was really interesting and I didn't want to talk to him about stuff that he was thinking, but like, it was really frustrating because like he was such an interesting guy and like, you know, he was seeing all this stuff and he did want to talk about it, just not to her. Um, and so she still got an article out of it. You know, she decided to make the story about about both of them and about like some of her shortcomings in relating to him. Um, but it was an interesting example of you know why 
journalists don't interview their friends. Um, and that's something that I had to deal with when I was working on the book because right. I was re reporting on her now. Um, so yeah. Um, we're just going to go, let's have like one question and then we can open it up to the audience. Um, essentially, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Sarah says in the book, and this comes up during her uh, tense, uh, sort of the confrontation with Dan in which, you know, uh, things get to a really, um, get to a really heated point. Um, she says that, I want to read this because it's, it's a great quote. Um, she's talking to him about journalism, and as you were kind of saying earlier, part of what she wants to do is sort of show him behind the scenes how journalism works. It's not just the printed article. She says, in a good story, someone changes. They thought they knew something, and then they have an experience, and, they, and that what they thought changes a little bit. Uh, what's changed most significantly for you in this time since you've come, since, since you've come back? A lot of things. Well, like for one thing, working on this book really, you know, that I don't know if I would call myself a journalist when I was on this trip. You know, I was kind of this bumbling cartoonist who was just trying to do the best she could. But I definitely consider myself a journalist now. Um, in the, you know, five years that I've been working on this, I've also been doing my own projects, like you mentioned before. And like, um, so without experiencing this and like having the ability to kind of just watch someone who knew, knows what they're doing do their job, I don't know if I would be doing this. Um, and so it gave me the confidence to do that. But it also, you know, like I think I went into this thinking of my friends as like very heroic, like the heroic journalist. And I think that's how, you know, I'd always imagined journalism before. It's this like selfless act and like, oh, the journalist goes out and they, they get the stories and they bring it back to people and, you know, then we all learn something. And then because of that journalism, the world is a better place. And, you know, I realize it is much more complicated than that. Like the journalist has to make some decisions that are, you know, ethically weird sometimes. And they feel weird about it too. You know, they don't just like go around willy nilly, like just making bad choices. Um, and, you know, also the journalist, like when we got back from this trip, I was given the opportunity to, to use some of the reporting that the globalist journalists had done to make a comic about Iraqi refugees. And when I got back, that was like the only thing that I cared about. I really wanted to do that. Um, that was Matt Bors, who's now the editor of The Nib. He asked me if I wanted to do something. So I, you know, used their reporting. I spent like a couple months on this comic and I had this idea in my head that like, I'm going to make this great, compelling comic about the Iraqi refugee situation and people are going to read it and they're going to donate money to like the, you know, the charity that we outline in the piece and they're going to write to their congressperson and they're going to like ask them to let in more refugees and, and up the funding for refugees. You know, I had this really naive kind of idea of like the impact that my work could make. And of course, like when a comic or anything comes out, you know, you're lucky if, you know, a hundred people read it. And like, they're not necessarily going to do anything about it. The, and that shouldn't be the point. The point of journalism is to like make people more informed and so that they know something um, that they didn't know before. And sometimes journalism that is a call to action can, you know, have really terrible consequences. The war in Iraq is an example of that because, you know, the New York Times and other places were reporting on, um, you know, these weapons of mass destruction as if, you know, this was a good thing that we should be doing. Um, and so people supported the war and then we have this disaster that we have now. So journalism can't be something that you do because you want a specific result. It has to be just like you care about the story, you want to get it out there, and you know what people are going to do with that information. You know, might be more oblique. It might they might read something about a refugee and have more empathy for you know someone in their life who has a really different situation. Like you never know. But I think the more information people have, the better. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, there is a microphone. If you find it, if, if you're able to uh, line up there, that would probably make it easier and we could all hear you as well. Thanks. You were speaking about uh, journalism and yet some of your language borders on editorialism and having your own point of view as to which, what you want to bring forward. Can you discern for me a little bit how you see the difference and where you might sit on the line. Sure. Um, well, I have a different um, way of speaking about this stuff when I'm talking about the book and in the book itself. So, 
in the work, you know, I'm not, like my voice isn't really part of the story at all. Um, I'm just kind of there as the narrator to like tell the tale. And so like, I'm trying to be more, you know, I think that I'm transparent about like, where, what my past is like, like what kind of like context I might be bringing into this kind of thing, like, but I don't spend a lot of time editorializing and talking about like, oh, the war was a really bad idea because I have, uh, there's other people talking about that. Um, when I'm talking about the book, I don't feel shy about saying how I feel about it because, you know, a, a talk, a book talk is not a piece of journalism. Um, and I feel like, you know, I, I feel, like I'm allowed to have my personality come through a little bit. So that's why. Uh, hi, thank you so much. Um, two questions, and you can choose both or neither or one. Um, so the first one was, uh, why did you find it important to draw yourself in, in the pictures? Uh, I know Joe Sacco does that a little bit and adds a sense of transparency. Um, for the reader. And then the second question was, uh, what elements of your identity uh, came to be most prominent when you were doing your work? Like, you know, you mentioned being an American kind of changed the nature of the conversation. Um, so what about that? What about your identity either surprised or didn't surprise you in being in that context? Yeah, um, well, I include myself in the comic, yeah, partly like what, for the reason that Joe Sacco does, like a lot of the journalism that I really enjoy um, is kind of like this, um, like the new journalism that started in the 70s, like that the journalist includes himself and I feel like it is a more honest and transparent way of presenting um, something because you know journalism isn't like some kind of mechanical floating eyeball that goes to places and just records what it sees. Like, or even if it did, there'd have to be someone controlling it. Um, it is a person making a decision to talk to this person or that person. Um, it's a person that has feelings and like, you know, fears and things like that. And so I really want to kind of like drive the point home that, you know, I'm there watching all of this. And I think that comics journalism has an extra layer that kind of um, makes that clear too. When you see something that's hand drawn, you're kind of always constantly reminded that somebody made this. You know, somebody was there and somebody is drawing this and somebody was thinking about this. Whereas, you know, with photojournalism, sometimes we can forget that there was a person there. It just kind of looks like you're seeing um, a scene. But, you know, photojournalism is subjective as well. They're showing you this part of the scene and not what's behind that. And that might be obscuring things just as much as, like, a drawing does. Um, so, yeah, I really, like... I put myself in for that reason, also because in both of my books, I kind of portray myself as a little bit of like, like the dummy that comes to town and doesn't know anything. Um, and I kind of hope that my audience is a little bit like me. Like, I hope that you come to this because you're not an expert in the war, you're not an expert in journalism, um, that maybe you're curious and you want to find stuff out. Um, but I want to be kind of the guide that you can trust. And if I'm like kind of transparent about the fact that I don't know anything, um, if I put myself in there, then you're reminded that I'm a person with flaws too and that I'm trying to learn as much as you are. I'm not just like, you know, I don't have a godlike perspective on the things that I'm seeing. Um, as far as your second question, I can't remember what it was. Can you remind me? Sorry. Yeah. It was just about um, like what elements of your identity uh, were more or less important when you were doing this work. Oh, yeah. Um, pretty important. I mean, um, as an American, being in these places, like, that's something that you're very conscious of. Um, you know, our policies affect lots and lots of people, you know, and that's kind of an understatement when it comes to Iraq. Like, so you have to be very sensitive about that and, um, you know, like, you almost kind of, like, you want to be able to say something, but that would be indulgent. To be like, I'm very sorry for what we did. Like, you know, you don't do that. But that's like, you know, that's how it feels. Um, and so, but you have to like kind of like push that all down and you're just there to take the story and to like, and if they want to yell at you, they yell at you and like you let them yell at you. Um, but it's very present, you know, like I don't feel American when I'm at home, but when I travel, I do, and you know, people do have questions that they want to answer. Um, so yeah, that's part of it. And definitely, when working on the book, like, you know, I, I want, 
other Americans to read this and to kind of get something out of it um, and, you know, to, yeah. So that is something that I think about a lot. Uh, would you mind, are you able to come to the microphone? Thank you. That would be helpful. So we don't have to repeat it. <laughs> Hello. Um, also sort of on the subject of like creating meta narrative, I'm wondering if when you're producing the book from the beginning, if you're aware of the multiple levels of like me meaning you want to convey. So if you're doing something like painting a photo and what that means as a trope, like do you know from the onset what you want to say on you know primary, secondary, tertiary levels or if that just sort of happens? <laughs> um, a lot of times, yeah. I think sometimes, I don't know, like art isn't this like mystical thing, but sometimes you kind of have an impulse to to paint something in a certain way and then, you know, as you're doing it, you realize like, oh, that's... I did something interesting there. Um, but yeah, like most of the time it is like purposeful. And I do go through a lot of iterations of the same scene or page. Like I'm like a big time editor. Um, and so like one of the reasons why I use a nine panel grid, besides the fact that I, it gives me some consistency and it gives me the freedom to like um, think about other things is that it's kind of makes it a modular comic. So I would take out scenes and then, you know, rearrange the panels in a way that made sense. Or I would like realize like in the Iraq chapter, I need more of this guy. And so I'd add a scene in um, because, you know, sometimes you don't see until you read over something that you've done that actually something's missing or actually maybe this doesn't work the way I did it. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the book was so late. I'm very sorry, Drawn and Quarterly. <laughs> um, you know, I kept on redoing things, and at a certain point, like, people actually had to tell me to just stop and keep going. Um, but yeah, like, comics is, is tough. Like, people think sometimes that nonfiction is easier because you're, it's based on reality, but there are infinite ways that you can portray something um, and, you know, show it with comics. So, you know, I'm always thinking about what I'm doing and especially with scenes where people are talking a lot because journalism is really a lot of people sitting in rooms and talking I was really self-conscious about the fact that I was going to have like multiple pages of just people talking um, and so like I wanted to jazz it up a little bit but you also don't want to just have something painted like jazzed up just for the sake of being jazzy um, and so yeah it was a lot of like hemming and hawing over how to make things work process very different from editing um, your memoir, for example? Because yeah. you had so much material. I think the memoir is much more straightforward. Yeah. It was just kind of this happened and this happened and like um, with this one, yeah, there's like, there's just a lot of material. Like I cut out, we spent like almost 10 days in Lebanon and I had to cut that whole part out because really it was more of a personal time for me and not really having anything to do with the story. So, yes. Oh. <laughs> but we are actually out of time. Oh, no. oh. Um, I want to remind you guys uh, that page and panel is selling Sarah's book. Um, and it's available